um, we want to get together and throw this together as quickly as possible. Because of that, um, we're, we're really providing a high 30,000 foot view level of the information that we've been able to assess and analyze to date. Um, we hopefully will have more uh, information for you as the, the days and, and weeks continue. For those of you who don't know, my name is Ken Robinson. And um, for those of you who can see my face and are seeing it for the first time, well, your, your luck has, uh, has ended, I suppose. Um, I know that many of us are um, attending uh, by audio, and you continue to be lucky. However, you will miss the, um, the PowerPoint presentation that we have, um, and, and we'll be speaking about some of the slides that, um, that will be um, represented on the screen. Um, don't, don't worry about that. We, we will have uh, this uh, webinar recorded, so you'll be able to uh, obtain a copy of it, as well as you'll have access to the uh, various slides and, and other practice or client alerts that we've produced over the past few weeks on various issues. All attendees are muted uh, at this time, and um, so, uh, so you're aware if you look down, if you have a screen in front of you and you're attending this WebEx, uh, in that manner you'll see that the third button from the right is, is a, a, a caption button, like a cartoon button where uh, words would appear. That's the button that you would want to use should you have uh, questions to ask of us, the panelists, during this presentation. You'll have an option to choose uh, where your question is directed to, whether to the host or to the panelists. I would invite you to send that to the panelists, uh, your questions. Um, however, we have received questions in advance from, from many of you, and we've uh, crafted this webinar to uh, include uh, some of those questions, as well as we'll have a dedicated question and answer portion where the panelists will ask questions of each other, and then we'll take questions from the attendees. I also wanted to introduce the rest of the immigration team. Uh, we have a talented team of professionals who have been working nonstop on these issues and have, um, have really worked hard to make sure that, that we're giving you the best information possible. There's Don Slowick. Don, can you? Uh, Bono Maitan, can you take yourself off mute, Bono? Bono, you're on mute. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah. Welcome, everybody, and we're so glad that you could be here with us today. Uh, Dana Bowes. Hi, Dana. And then there's Miranda West. So uh, today we're going to begin by addressing the, the proverbial elephant in the room, and that is the, the tweet turned presidential proclamation. Uh, next, uh, we address uh, how the, the presidential proclamation, or maybe you've seen it as executive order, um, how it, it may be enforced and whether or not there may be a delay in its enforcement. Following that, we're going to speak for a few minutes about how and why we should be advocating for employment-based immigration. And, and I know that, that can be difficult, especially in light of the uh, relatively high or historically high unemployment that the U.S. is now facing. Finally, we're going to have that promised uh, panel where, where we're going to have questions and answers that hopefully will, will address the questions that, that you as, as business as businesses and employers and, and um, their foreign national talent, um, those questions that you have in mind, and addressing travel, COVID-19 issues, and other matters. So to begin, COVID-19 is, is more than a health crisis, and it's more than a financial economic crisis. For many of us attending this, this webinar today, it's also a, a plague on immigration. We're experiencing impacts uh, on travel, on applications uh, in petition processing times. We're seeing difficulty in obtaining benefits in a timely manner. Um, of course, there are procedural delays to immigration processes and delays in court, uh, biometric processing and interview cancellations. Over the course of the past few weeks, we have seen the Trump administration make more than a dozen affirmative changes to the U.S. immigration system. Um, 
and, and oftentimes they're they're citing the coronavirus pandemic to to make those changes. Now, they're largely cutting off immigration to the country. Refu refugee resettlement has been put on hold. Visa offices are closed. Uh, citizenship ceremonies are being canceled, and, and it, also we're seeing um, those who are detained in the United States uh, quickly spirited outside of the United States, and this includes children arrested at the border. So let's talk about uh, the actual proclamation itself. And um, I know that there have been um, many, many questions uh, ever since the president tweeted about it. and since administration officials have spoken about it between the tweet on Monday night and the actual proclamation being published on Wednesday night. Um, so there's a lot of confusion about who this applies to and, and what the, really the scope of it is. So um, Aaron, if, if we can put on the, uh, the PowerPoint. So in red is, is really the part that you need to focus on. Um, and, and for those of you who can't see it, uh, we, we have a, a PowerPoint slide which, which indicates the presidential proclamation, which is suspending immigration as of April 22nd, 2020, for a period of 60 days. This applies to any individual seeking to enter the U.S. Um, as an immigrant who is first outside of the United States. So we, we can, can stop there for, for many of us and, and, and think about that, because if you're here in the United States listening to this webinar um, and you've got a green card case in process, or you're about to file for your adjustment of status, or I-140 petition, or you're about to engage in a PERM uh, recruitment, or you have pending PERM applications. You know, all of these, um, um, you know, the, these issues are untouched by the presidential proclamation. Uh, but, but I don't want you to tune out right now and, and, and log off, because there's certainly much more than, that we have to tell you. Um, but, but just remember, if, if you're in H-1B status and you're getting an extension or amendment, or if you have you know, a fiscal year cap petition that's being prepared or has been filed for you, um, the presidential proclamation you know, does not address uh, your situation. It does address, though, if you're outside the United States, if you do not have a valid immigrant visa as of April 23rd, 2020, that's a, a visa stamp that's actually put into your passport, and um, that you don't have another official travel document as an immigrant. Um, advanced parole is one such travel benefit. Um, a boarding foil is, is another uh, travel document that is, is oftentimes put into your passport and allows for travel for immigrants. Now, uh, we, we don't have uh, any reason to believe that this uh, proclamation touches upon any foreign nationals outside of the United States either. Um, while the proclamation uh, doesn't address this specifically, um, and, and really uh, shouldn't need to, um, it, it, it does uh, address some, some other uh, essentially classes of people who, who, might, who are going to be impacted by the um, proclamation. So, for example, um, foreign nationals um, who, who are petitioning for loved ones um, who are not um, the foreign national themselves who make, who's doing the petition and sponsoring family members may be a green card holder. Um, and their uh, foreign national family members, um, their applications um, and um, the processing, that's been put on hold. Um, what hasn't been put on hold are immigrant visa physicians, immigrant visa nurses, and healthcare workers, uh, primarily those who are coming here to help fight the COVID-19 virus. EB-5 immigrant investors um, are still permitted to, to proceed as uh, they, they would have before the, uh, the current proclamation doesn't address um, their immigration situation, nor does it address some others that I'm not sure how many might apply to who's on this webinar, but certain special immigrants who are coming to the U.S. Um, in, in one of these extraordinary statuses or capacities um, that the proclamation doesn't touch upon them. Now, the fact that the proclamation doesn't address foreign nationals on non-immigrant visas um, who are outside the United States doesn't mean those folks aren't going to have difficulty coming back to the United States, because essentially at, at this time, you know, the consular offices 
you know, are, are closed. They're not having interviews and processing non-immigrant visa applications um, at this moment. Hopefully, they'll be able to do that very soon. Um, President Trump's proclamation would essentially indefinitely block uh, immigration in certain categories that the, pardon me, that the administration uh, failed to eliminate in a bill before the U.S. Senate in February, uh, I think it's February 2018. Now, um, that bill was voted down um, you know, by, in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, but the language that we see in the presidential proclamation really mirrors that bill. It stops uh, somewhat that the president has identified as chain migration um, for for 60 days. And you know, the, the president uh, may have some you know, some concerns, or his administration may have some concerns regarding the enforceability of the the proclamation, given that essentially Congress has has already spoken about it. And, and the president can't uh, or shouldn't be able to legislate um, you know, by, by fiat, um, especially when another, uh, the legislative body has already spoken. Now, what I've told you with regard to non-immigrant visa holders, those in H-1B, L-1s, TNs, uh, Es, you know, O-1s, you know, perhaps uh, you, you have a, a, some, a temporary reprieve. But I will um, caution you that it may just be that temporary, because the uh, the language of the proclamation calls for a review, a 30-day review of the H-1B and other temporary visa programs. Um, in effect, the, the Trump administration rewrote law without passing bills through Congress. Um, we're we're definitely going to be watching very closely what happens with regard to the president's um, continuing efforts or changes, both to this particular proclamation, uh, should it be extended, uh, as well as additional uh, order, executive orders or proclamations that, that do um, touch upon more, uh, uh, more of us who are, who are on this webinar. So um, with that said, I'd like to turn it over to, um, to Bono, who is gonna speak to us uh, about the immediate and future impact of this uh, order. Hi, everyone. This is Bono. Thank you again for joining us again. Um, I wanted to briefly just discuss the process and timeline of um, this proclamation. So as we all know, on April 20th, President Trump tweeted his intent to suspend all immigration. On April 22nd, he signed a proclamation temporarily suspending new immigration. A proclamation is a kind of a presidential document. Proclamations, like executive orders, are published in the Federal Registrar. This is, uh, this is how the process works. And for those of you that are on video can see the um, PowerPoint that we have up. If not, you will receive a copy of it. Um, the process includes the president announcing the executive order or proclamation and providing some very basic details. A version of it is then printed on the White House website. The official version is then printed in the Federal Register. All presidential documents are then published as part of the presidential compilation of documents. The yearly presidential compilation of documents is then printed in the most recent version of Title III of the Code of Federal Regulations. So there is a process that it must go through and follow. Um, there's also no clear distinction between a proclamation and an executive order. They both serve essentially the same function and are both subject to the same checks and balances. They're also treated interchangeably in court. One significant difference is that an executive order is usually directed at people within the government, whereas a proclamation is usually directed at people outside the government, such as the public. Because of this, proclamations are legally weaker than executive orders. However, proclamations, just like executive orders, can still be subject to uh, review in federal court. One example 
of an executive order that was challenged in federal court was the travel ban. Um, as you can see here is this next slide. From the time that the travel ban was signed as an executive order to when the Supreme Court ruled on it was about a year and a half. The travel ban was challenged almost immediately and the courts issued an injunction blocking the executive order from going into effect. This current proclamation that President Trump just signed a couple of days ago is limited to 60 days. And because it's narrowly limited, we may not see much litigation on it. Uh, however, there is the possibility that this proclamation can be and will be extended. And um, also there, you know, President Trump may add um, more categories. So this is still, you know, developing and we'll still continue to monitor, monitor it and send out alerts when we know more. Thanks, Bonnie. Yeah. John? Yeah, uh, to follow up on what uh, Bono said, uh, the proclamation is actually modeled closely uh, to the uh, one upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in Trump versus, excuse me, Hawaii versus Trump. Uh, and there the Supreme Court said that the president under the uh, Immigration Act has wide discretion to uh, suspend entry of immigrants when to do so would be detrimental to the national interest. In other words, when their entry into the United States would be detrimental to the, United, to the U.S. interest. Uh, so in the wording of the proclamation, of course, the, the president has used that uh, language and said that, um, quote, he's talking about the problem of unemployment in the United States. Uh, suddenly, actually, the most recent count I saw is we're at over 26 million unemployed. And so he's pointing to immigration as contributing to the problem now but with so many unemployed people that we can't have more people come in on immigrant visas to take jobs that would be going to U.S. workers. So he said, um, while most uh, most of the immigration is, is family-based uh, immigration. Uh, some of it is employment-based, and the difference there is you can immigrate to the United States either based on a petition by a family member, such as a U.S. citizen, uh, uh, or uh, based on a uh, petition by uh, an employer, which is called employment-based immigration. Uh, the family-based immigration is based on the family relationship. The employment-based immigration is based on the job offer from the U.S. employer. So uh, President Trump is explaining in the executive order that the um, person who comes to the United States on a green card on a, on a family-based visa has an instant ticket to work in any job in the United States, uh, and that therefore these individuals pose a threat to individuals who are currently unemployed, particularly individuals who are unemployed that are marginal. Uh, Aaron, please, the next slide. So those that are particularly vulnerable are African Americans, other minorities, those without college degrees, and the disabled. And they, they are most likely to bear the brunt of the excess labor supply. Uh, so therefore, um, most of the employment, uh, most of the immigration coming in is based on family petitions. These petitions only require family relationship. They don't require a job offer and they don't require any kind of test of the U.S. job market. Um, and then even those petitions that are based on an offer of employment uh, and require a process called labor certification to see if there's a U.S. worker available, that the problem with those is that the labor certifications are stale. They don't capture the current economic crisis. Next slide, please. Um, so this, this sounds good. Uh, you know, it's reasonable, right? You know, we've got all these people employed, 22, 26 million, and why should we have foreign workers coming in? And in fact, 
uh, President Trump was aware of polling that was done recently uh, by um, USA Today that showed basically over 80% of Americans supported the idea of a temporary freeze on all on immigration into the United States. Uh, so you, if you compare that with polling on how he's handling the coronavirus crisis, uh, the poll done in April by um, NBC and Wall Street Journal showed that only 44% of Americans approved of how he was handling the crisis. So this is a great way to distract people, to distract them from the problems with the coronavirus and get them to focus on his immigration agenda, where he's going to have a lot of public support. But the problem is that the uh, several problems with the proclamation, and these are the types of issues that the court might uh, uh, explore if the, if the proclamation is challenged. Uh, in the first place, uh, immigration has been decreasing. Next slide, please. So uh, U.S. Department of Homeland Security statistics uh, for fiscal year 2018 and fiscal year 2019 show that there's been a decrease in fiscal year 2019 of immigrants coming from outside the United States. So in, in, in uh, 2019 compared to 2018, admissions decreased by 6%, new arrivals decreased by 13%. So we're already trending down and that the end of that fiscal year of 2019 would have been September uh, 30 of, of uh, last year. So we were trending down uh, even before this recent rash of executive orders and policy pronouncements that Ken was referring to that have been coming at us fast and furious in the, in the last several weeks and past few months. Another point that I want to call to your attention is that out of the immigration that comes to the United States, there was in fiscal year 2019, it was only about a million total that came to the United States. Uh, so even if every one of those persons took a job from an American with 26 million unemployed, it's not going to make a big difference. Uh, and most of those uh, 1 million people uh, are family-based uh, immigrants, not employment-based immigrants. So actually about 70% of the people who came in were employment were family-based and not uh, employment-based. Only about 14% uh, were employment-based. So when you're talking about restricting employment-based immigration uh, as a way of solving the problem of, of unemployment, it's, it's wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a drop in the bucket at, at most. So there's not just there's not much impact to that. Next slide, please. Furthermore, with the rash of recent uh, announcements and pronouncements, the public charge rule, the things that Ken was talked about earlier, the travel ban, Muslim travel ban that's been expanded now, now includes 13 countries, 7% of the world population. The, the stop on migrants crossing our border, uh, U.S. consulate have paused visa processing, immigrant visas in the United States by USAS have been postponed along with citizen interviews. All of these things are, are further curtailing immigration. You really don't need this proclamation to further decrease immigration. Uh, Trump's doing a great job of that already. Next slide, please. So some of the uh, assumptions made in the proclamation are false. Uh, there have been studies done, numerous studies about the impact of immigration on the United States workforce. They include, you know, do, do, do immigrants lead to greater unemployment by U.S. citizen workers or U.S. workers who have green cards? The answer is no. Does it lead to a dilution of the wages of U.S. workers? Will immigrants coming in result in, in lower wages? The answer is no. And actually, uh, studies have shown that immigration helps us recover from situations we are exactly in right now, where we're going to go through or we're already in a recession and we're going to need to bring the economy back to life. Next slide, please. So one study that was done on the uh, increase of unemployment of U.S. workers, a May 2018 study by uh, an organization called the National Foundation for American Policy, 
this study studied um, to, to, used a state level analysis to look at immigrants for the years 2005 to 2018, and it was controlled for economic conditions. Uh, and it found that uh, immigration does not increase U.S. natives' unemployment or reduce their labor force participation. And to the contrary, the study found that having more immigrants reduces the unemployment rate and raises the labor force participation of U.S. natives. Next slide, please. There are other studies that, that show similar conclusions. Uh, immigration does not de decrease the wages of U.S. workers. Here, uh, a study issued in May 2014 that examined 30 years of research on this topic found that decades of research have provided little support for the claim that immigrants depress wages by competing with native workers. Most studies for industrial countries have found on average no effect of the wages on native workers. Next slide, please. So immigration does not hurt uh, our, our workforce. It doesn't take away jobs from US workers. It doesn't dilute their wages. To the contrary, immigration actually helps economic growth. So a study done in May of 2018 looked at um, the economic gains that America saw coming out of the 2008 uh, depression or um, retraction, economic contraction. Uh, 2011, and it's found that economic gains and but for immigrants contributing to the quantity and quality of the labor system. And this was a study done by uh, financial institution City of Citibank and economists at Oxford University. Um, as also recently noted in an opinion piece, well, not recently, but in May of 2017, um, the chief economist for Morgan Stanley said, virtually no nation has ever sustained rapid economic growth without strong, public popu strong population growth. And at a time when every major country, including the U.S., faces con continued decline in population growth, workers are, are an increasingly precious source of econ national and economic strength. So we need more people to grow the economy. We don't need fewer people to grow the economy. Next slide, please. Finally, the proclamation is based on some faulty premises and are going to hurt businesses that have been following the law to sponsor people foreign workers for H-1B visas and for employment-based green cards. Very difficult process, a very complex pro process. Next slide. So although it's true that family-based immigrants are granted open market employment authorization, which is what the proclamation says, that is definitely not true for individuals who immigrate on an offer of permanent employment from a U.S. employer. And these are individuals who, con who are Although they're a smaller group than family-based immigrants, uh, they're very economically important because they are working in science, technology, engineering, and other high-skill occupations. And they pose no threat to American workers who, have, who are at the, quote, quote, margin between employment and unemployment, as described in the proclamation. These are high-skilled workers. Uh, they remain in demand and, in fact, are necessary for America's uh, economic comeback. We have found that no U.S. employer is going to spend the time and the money to sponsor somebody for an H-1B visa or sponsor them for a green card based on an offer of employment if they could find similarly skilled American workers. Uh, I think that's going to hold true in this crisis as well. Uh, I don't think that curtailing employment-based immigration is, is going to mount the hill of beans in, in solving the problem. And in fact, it's going to leave us worse off. So, I would encourage everybody, since this is a political game, and uh, that's why the president has, has issued this proclamation, and there may be more coming down the road. The only way you can fight politics is with politics. And so employers, uh, you should, and, and um, everybody who, who uh, lives in a congressional district, which is gonna be everybody, uh, Contact your elected representatives, contact your elected U.S. senators, contact your trade associations and organizations uh, with other associations, and tell them to stop, tell the president to stop this nonsense. Don't punish employment-based immigrants. Uh, 
I would like to see, you know, uh, everybody benefit, not only employment-based immigrants, but family-based immigrants as well. But if you're talking about suspending immigration to help employment, the unemployment problem, the employment-based immigrants are not the place to look. Thank you. Thanks, Don. That was very enlightening. Let's discuss um, some, some questions um, that we know um, that many of you on this webinar have for us. The first question um, that, that I'm hearing uh, asked quite a bit is if um, foreign nationals should be traveling once permitted to do so um, for either work or personal reasons. Don, I'm going to throw this uh, to you. Well, going back to the proclamation, in the proclamation it says in 30 days, uh, there's going to be a review conducted of non-immigrant visa processing. So thankfully, all non-immigrant classes were left out of the proclamation, but as Ken mentioned, uh, they're, they're in the target. Uh, they're in President's target. So I would, not let, I would not recommend that anybody make travel plans until not only that 30-day period is passed, but also a 50-day period from the issuance of the proclamation, at which point Trump, President Trump is going to review whether or not to extend it. Uh, that's important information to have before you're, you're planning a trip. The next thing you should do is if you work for a company, check with your employer on, on the trip and see, see what they say about it. What, what, what do they want you to do in, in that respect? Uh, we're still um, in a time and we are going to be in a time for quite some, some while where there will be uh, restrictions on people entering not only the United States, but also U.S. Uh, citizens and green card holders and non-immigrants working in the United States entering other countries due to the coronavirus. So you have to check that on a real-time basis. And that changes, it's going to change all the time, or it could change uh, randomly. Uh, based on, or unexpectedly based on the fact that there could be a comeback of the coronavirus, even in areas where it's, it's diminished and, and, and uh, lockdown has been relaxed. So that, um, and another problem is you're going to have uh, delays at the airports with the more elaborate health screenings uh, that are, you have to be taken into account. Uh, you're also going to have problems just scheduling flights because fewer flights are available. Uh, so um, these are all things that need to be considered before uh, planning a trip. Also, you may want to hold off on traveling for some time if you are required to consul a process for a visa stamp, um, because we expect continued delays in processing due to backlogs created by the closed offices and consular posts. Thank you. Um, also for you, Don, what's likely going to happen to the H-4 E-80 program in light of everything that's going on right now? It's toast, Ken. Uh, this is a, a political game, and we're, we got, I don't know how many days between now and the election, but Trump's got a lot of stuff he's going to be taking care of in an area where he sees a, his strength, uh, immigration. The, right now, the times are ideal for for uh, him to take these steps that he couldn't get through earlier, couldn't get through in the U.S. Senate, you know. Um, and so, I would expect this will be on the chopping block. Final, your thoughts? Yes, um, I think you're right, Don. Um, however, I do think that uh, any attempt to stop the H-4 EAD visa program will likely be met with resistance and it will be challenged in court. Um, however, for the time being, um, other than applying when eligible now, you really can't make any other plans related to what may occur on this issue. If the H-4 EAD goes away, um, what we do know by past experience is that those that are currently on H-4 EAD will still be able to hold on to their employment authorization until it expires. We don't expect that your employment authorization will cease on the day that the EAD is taken away. So that yeah. may be some, 
seven years. Thanks, Mom. Question for you, Ken, from from participants. If I'm furloughed or laid off on an F1 OPT or F1 STEM OPT, how, mm -hmm. how long will I be out of work? So um, that's a great question. There, there are um, different considerations for the F1 OPT, which is the initial 12 months of optional practical training available to, to um, all students who graduate um, after every level of graduation, bachelor's, master's, doctorate. Um, and then there's the 24 months of um, an extension of, of STEM OPT, which is uh, for those who have graduated in certain fields in science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics. And, and uh, as we look at the first F1 OPT, you can be furloughed or put into a non-productive status uh, for up to 90 days um, or uh, up until the, um, the, the expiration uh, date on that um, H, uh, pardon me, on that um, OPT, on the employment authorization document itself. If um, you're in F1 STEM OPT uh, in that 24 month period, you're eligible for up to uh, 150 day of um, non-productive status. However, um, any days of non-productive status that you took or may have taken um, under your first F1 OPT uh, is counted against the 150 days. Um, so that, that's an aggregate number that's available in your STEM OPT. For example, if, if you are um, unlucky and you have 90 days of unemployment under your F1 OPT um, and then secure resume employment, then when you are on an F1 STEM OPT, you've got another 60 days available. So that's how um, you know, that would work. Um, Don, with so many people out of work today, I, I recognize that uh, that huge number that we have, 26 million, many of those people will go back to the job, their jobs once the economy begins to open up. This isn't a, this isn't a normal um, unemployment that we've seen when the economy has been in recession before, um, like in 2008 or, or other times in our economy. But, but the numbers are still very, very high. So, um, given that, um, well, given that, um, what do you see um, in terms of an impact on any future or pending PERM um, application or I-140 process based upon you know, the current economy? If the employer is having a layoff within six months of the date of filing the PERM application, they are required, and, and layoff, excuse me, a layoff in the occupation involved in the PERM application or in a related occupation to the one in the PERM application, then the employer is required under the regulations to notify those workers who were laid off and give them an opportunity to apply for the position. So the regulation says that the employer, quote, must document that it has notified and considered all potentially qualified laid off U.S. workers of the job opportunity involved in the PERM application and the results of the notification and consideration. So this is called notification and consideration. It's, it's more of an obligation on the employer than perm, normal PERM recruitment would be uh, because the employer has to consider the applicant and really be prepared to explain to the Department of Labor why this person would not be able to do the job within a reasonable period of training. Uh, so that's a, that's a very strict requirement. But it does not apply if the layoff occurs after you file the PERM application uh, or during the process before it's approved. Uh, and there may be additional restrictions or, or complications for the employer, and I'll let Bono address those. Bono? Thanks, Don, Ken. Um, as we all know, um, in the PERM process, the Department of Labor's objective is to protect the U.S. worker in the workforce, right? So given that there are now 26 million people on unemployment, the likely result will be that the Department of Labor will be taking longer to process PERM applications. Um, they'll issue a lot more PERM audits and most likely require supervised recruitment. Um, 
all of which most of our clients don't have much experience with, but um, will likely uh, will likely see much more of in the future. Um, all of this will make the perm processing slower, may result in more denials of perm applications, and um, will likely make the cost to obtain a perm a lot more expensive, unfortunately. Um, Ken, what is, uh, what is the status of premium processing service? Right. Um, on March 20th, uh, the government announced without warning that premium, the premium processing program would be stopped um, for, um, for all petitions and, and um, that, that USCIS um, allowed premium processing for. Um, we expected premium processing to not be available for fiscal year H-1B cap subject petitions. Um, and, and in past years, we ha have also seen suspension of the program um, more broadly with, with extensions and, and, and other H-1B um, petitions. But um, I, I have a, you know, a suspicion that, that the cessation of the premium processing program this year um, it is a little uh, more uh, aggressive and it, it may be quite a bit longer uh, before the premium processing program returns. I think uh, the Trump administration um, doesn't have any interest in making immigration easier on employers or their foreign national talent. And so uh, without premium processing, you know, it's taking longer to uh, receive responses on um, requests for benefit. Some individuals may um, lose employment authorization for a period of time or uh, perhaps they will be uh, less mobile in the workforce going from one H-1B employer to another. Um, changes of status also will be uh, delayed. You know, and all of these things um, serve uh, the Trump administration's interest in, in making immigration uh, less convenient. Um, hopefully, uh, we do see um, premium processing resume, um, but, um, but there's, there's no indication as to when that might happen. Um, and we understand that this has a real practical implication on foreign nationals, um, especially you know, given uh, situations of extensions um, or changes of status when um, the, the former status or the expires. That's going to make it harder for many to extend their driver's licenses. It's going to create uh, issues or interfere with travel plans. And of course, uh, it's just going to create more stress unfortunately, and, and uncertainty in the immigration process. So um, that's, um, you know, premium processing is, is a valuable program, but unfortunately, um, we, we, we can't count on it um, for the foreseeable future. And not to add any more stress, um, but Don, can you talk to us briefly about who is eligible for unemployment benefits or the government's um, $1,200 stimulus check? Yeah, let me uh, speak to the stimulus check. That's that $1,200 check you can get if your income is, is $75,000 or less, and then a reduced amount if your income is up to $99,000, and you can double those amounts if you have a, a, family, a spouse and family. Uh, the children would get $500 each. Uh, all very good. Um, these checks have been sent to individuals who uh, are um, not non-resident aliens as described by the uh, IRS rules. Uh, so that means um, these are checks that have gone to uh, H-1B workers, for example. You might say, well, wait a minute, H-1B worker, isn't that a non-resident alien? And the answer is under IRS regs, no. The IRS has its own test of what non-resident alien is for purposes of the tax law and that it uh, to be one you either have a green card or you meet what's called the substantial presence test uh, and that's based on how many days you've been in the united states during a three-year period uh, so uh, most h1bs would, would meet this substantial uh, presence test uh, and therefore be uh, non-resident aliens uh, for purposes of um, of uh, 
the, um, oh, I'm sorry, would be resident aliens, excuse me, I got confused, would be re resident aliens for purposes of the IRS. So, um, F1 students and J1 students are not uh, sub subject to the substantial presence test. Therefore, they would not qualify as resident aliens under the uh, green card test. Uh, and uh, Don, Don, if I may, um, yeah. can I a follow-up question on that. Um, we've, um, I know what the, the government, uh, the IRS, what they're looking at is they're looking at to see if they're um, if the, the person has a social security number, certainly, um, and um, if they've um, you know, filed uh, a U.S. Uh, tax return for the prior year, uh, among some other things. Um, and, and I believe that um, that the government is getting confused. One, because the IRS, they, they don't really possess um, immigration information for foreign nationals. And so we're seeing, for example, F1 students and some F1 students who are already outside of the United States, they're, they're no longer F1 students, but they were in previous years or they may have worked for a year or more um, on OPT or STEM OPT, but they have received these stimulus checks. Um, how would you counsel those folks who, who might receive them, um, but perhaps by law are not entitled to them? Right. Um, I, I don't know that uh, this is a government mistake. Uh, basically, so they should not have gotten the checks, and they did. Uh, I don't know that if you kept the, of course, ideally you would return the check, you return the money. Uh, but if you would have, say you've already spent it, uh, uh, do you need then to have to dig into your savings to, to refund the money? Uh, I think the question would be whether, uh, in terms of immigration law, it would have any impact on your future, either renewing your H-1B or whatever non-immigrant visa you're on, or uh, your eligibility to get green, a green card, lawful permanent residence, or even U.S. citizenship. And I don't see this kind of situation as being uh, any, in any way fraudulent uh, or a misrepresentation made to the government in any way. You, you were honest, they just made a mistake and you benefited from it. So I don't see it as posing a major problem for future immigration purposes. Right, and you do want to certainly check your your most recently filed tax return to see how you may have indicated whether you um, whether as a non-resident alien or, or resident alien. Um, it, let me speak about the unemployment question that that Bono had. Um, certainly, the unemployment and trans eligibility and benefits have been expand, expanded um, under um, recent legislation. Um, most uh, eligibility requirements are. Uh, state-based, and they vary from state to state. However, generally what, what we see is um, with regard to eligibility, um, the, the applicant for unemployment insurance must demonstrate that, um, that you are employable, ready, uh, and available for work. And if, um, if you were, for example, previously on H-1B status and you have been furloughed or, or TN or um, you know, other L, or other non-immigrant statuses, um, that's a status that is tied to the employment relationship that the foreign national has with the employer. And so when, when that ends, um, so too then does the, you know, uh, the status, and therefore that individual shouldn't be considered as being immediately available for work. I know that there's also issues of a grace period and um, you know, perhaps getting um, Future um, each subsequent H-1B filing on, um, on on your behalf, but but still, I think that um, those individuals wouldn't be um, eligible under most state standards. There, there is a question as to whether or not somebody who's been on optional practical training um, F-1 OPT who has an employment authorization document, um, whether they're eligible, uh, or somebody who's on H-4 status. Uh, and has the H-4 EAD, whether they're eligible for unemployment. Um, arguably, they, they might be for some period of time, provided that they met the other eligibility requirements. Um, however, um, if the H-4 um, applicant who's applying for insurance with a valid um, EAD or employment authorization document um, does file, but is no, it is known that 
her or his spouse um, no longer has H1B because he or she has been let go, then, um, then I think that it, it might be considered a fraudulent filing um, because the H4 status is tied directly to the H1B. And um, when the H1B is no longer in status, uh, so too the H4 is no longer in status. So, um, Bono, have you been keeping track of yes. some questions that have been coming in? Yes. Um, so first and foremost, I just want to reiterate that the proclamation that went into effect um, a couple of days ago only applies to individuals who are seeking to enter the U.S who are outside of the U.S. who do not have a valid immigrant visa as of April 23rd and who do not have a valid official travel document, such as a passport or advanced parole. The proclamation does not apply to individuals who are in the U.S. Um, on non-immigrant visas, such as H-1Bs, L's, F's, O's. Um, it does not apply to those individuals. I know we're seeing a lot of questions coming in um, if it's going to affect H-1B visa holders, and this proclamation does not. Yeah, so I and, and I, everyone... yeah if I could also follow up on that. And, and I think it's uh, fair to say that it doesn't impact non-immigrant visa holders outside of the United States as well, right? So right. The, the proclamation doesn't do that. Yeah, so if you are in the U.S. Um, and you're an H-1B visa holder and you're going through the green card process, your process will continue. There will likely be delays because USCIS has canceled all in-person interviews for the time being. And once they open back up, they have to reschedule all of the interviews that were canceled. So there will be, there will be delays, but um, that process has not gone away. Um, and there are, let's see, um, Don, there was a question for you regarding um, F-1 visas eligible for stimulus check, but there are people on F-1s who received it. Will it affect the current H-1B process? I, I'd give the similar answer to uh, what, what I gave to the question about somebody getting it uh, with who, who shouldn't have gotten it. Uh, I don't think it would. Uh, ideally, if you still have the money and you can return it, you, you do that. But if you spend it already, I don't think you have to try to fork up the funds to return it to the government. I don't think it's going to make a difference. And the stimulus check is not going to be counted um, against the public charge rule, correct? Correct. No, it would not be. No. So if you've received it, then I would say, you know, either you can um, try to contact the IRS, um, but that may be that may be difficult to do so right now. Right, and we would always encourage you to consult with a, individually with an attorney about it, um, so you you do the right thing. Uh, we're, we speak only in general terms about immigration impact. We're not offering specific advice to individuals in this call. You also want to make sure, you know. Uh, in terms of the tax law, you're okay in, in that regard as well. So talk to a CPA or somebody who knows tax law. Right. Um, um, and, we may have time for maybe one more question. Right. I was just going to say, following up with that, there are a lot of, um, I think, personal questions, and we don't want to address anyone and speak about anyone's case personally here. So if you have a question that we didn't get to, please send us an email. Um, but as far as questions that are related to today's Topic. Um, I saw a question here, Bono. Uh, is this going to affect I-130 petition for alien relative processing? Yes. Uh, I my, my my answer would be no. It, it should no. not do that uh, because that's that's not the same as being an uh, outside the United States. Uh, applying for an immigrant visa at a U.S. consulate. The petition actually is a, one of the steps to get to the point where you, you can apply for the visa, but it's not the same thing at all. Right. And remember, this, this proclamation it just suspends new immigration for 60 days. This is not set in stone. This is not 
um, an order that is that's going to take effect, you know, forever. This is a I, temporary suspension for a certain limited class of individuals. Right. It, it certainly is, is limited. Um, but I, I think to Don's point that there really isn't a nexus between this order um, and its and its claimed justifications to, to help the economy and um, to address the COVID-19 crisis that, um, that, that I don't see why the president wouldn't extend it unless you know, the courts had spoken uh, on the issue. Um, you know, I, I think it very well, it, it's likely in my mind that it would be extended just because it has no rational basis um, in, um, you know, based on what the president has, has articulated. Right, so if you're in the U.S. and you're currently working um, on a temporary visa, this does not affect you. Okay. The H-1B lottery yeah. process will still continue. Um, the lottery has occurred, but the H-1B process will still continue. This is not going to affect the H-1B process. I think it's safe to, to kind of make a, a general statement, at least for everybody who's in the United States. Also, it's being done on your behalf, whether that's in the non-immigrant visa context or, or on the green card related path, um, all of that work will continue, um, you know, as, as um, planned, um, you know, with the proviso that, you know, your, your employer gets to make these decisions um, going forward, and we certainly don't want to take away that responsibility, but um, there's nothing um, as of yet in the government's proclamation or prior um, COVID-19 related immigration restrictions that is going to impact the work we're doing for all of you right now. So. Okay, one last question. How is this going to impact visa stamping in home country in the suspension period? Well, mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I'd like to just reiterate that, you know, Don addressed this and I'd like to kind of emphasize that we're discouraging travel abroad uh, during this period, during the suspension period, um, certainly during the 30 day period where there's a review. And that while, while the president may not have a decision made on the 31st day, you know, I think that there will be something in the works with, that will or may address um, non-immigrant visa holders. And, and so we, we don't want individuals outside of the country uh, when um, you know, some negative decisions might be made by the Trump administration um, that, that we could see would clearly impact the issuance of um, non-immigrant visas um, or any kind of consular processing. So our, our general advice um, would be first seek, um, you know, seek a discussion with your employer, discuss uh, personal and business-related travel, um, and, um, and they'll, they'll reach out to us generally um, with regard to discussing the particular case. It's uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, I would discourage uh, employers and, and, and their employees from making travel plans um, during these next few months until the, you know, the, the, there's more stabilization and we have a better idea as to um, what the administration's plans are. Right, and um, one more thing. If you are outside of the country currently and you are um, stuck because of the travel restrictions, uh, we would advise that you keep an eye on those. Um, monitor and check the Department of Travel's website um, to see when the travel restrictions are lifted um, so that you can travel home safely. Yeah, the Department of State, right? Absolutely. Yes. Listen, I, I want to thank everybody for uh, giving us your time this, uh, this Friday afternoon. Hopefully, everybody's going to have a, uh, a good and safe and healthy weekend, and I look forward to continue um, you know, assisting you um, with uh, your, your business immigration needs. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.